men too, I guess, but <laughs> have a seat also works. <laughs> As has uh, been the case in uh, each week of Advent, we find ourselves dealing with not one, but two, count them, prophets. In our Old Testament lesson for this day, it is Micah. And briefly, this is another passage that has been um, assimilated by Christians as a proof text about Jesus and his connection to David. I hope you get this in your diaconal stuff, right? <laughs> and that is why it is here before us now as the countdown to Christmas begins in all seriousness with just a few days to go. Uh, but be clear, it is not a prophecy about Jesus. Again, prophets were not soothsayers or fortune tellers. But it is a word of hope. It is a reminder from Micah, who was a contemporary of Amos and of the first Isaiah. It is a reminder to Israel and Judah that in spite of the death and destruction now being wrought by Sennacherib, the Neo-Assyrian king who brought an end to Israel and extracted a hefty tribute from King Hezekiah of Judah in Jerusalem, that God had made a promise, a promise to David. And by that promise, they could rest assured that one of David's descendants would return and again sit enthroned as a ruler of the reunited kingdom. That's right. It is a word of defiant hope spoken in opposition to the evidence on the ground, or perhaps the scorched earth, as it may have been in, in various places. <laughs> the Christians seized on this passage because it mentions Bethlehem. And you can thank Matthew for immortalizing Micah's words as he quotes the prophet in the story of the Magi. Uh, Herod's scribes read from Micah this very passage. Though the uh, tradition about Jesus being from, uh, or being a native of Bethlehem and not from Nazareth, uh, predates the Gospels by at least a couple of decades. And theologians since Matthew have spun those deeper themes of humility and scandal and lowliness and a sort of inverse kingship that were not a part of Micah's original meaning. Still, given all of the unpacking we might need to do to hear Micah's original intent, the prophet's defiant hope will suffice for this morning. The second prophet is one of Luke's making. And I'm talking about a character we invariably encounter every Advent season, and that, of course, is Mary. But today's encounter is extraordinary, and in a season of prophets, it is, it is the fitting conclusion as we reach the highest notes. Mary. Now, while Mark's gospel pretends not to know her, well, okay, the gospel acknowledges on two occasions that Jesus at least had a mother, of course, right? Uh, uh, but, you know, not much beyond that, and nothing connected with any sort of uh, birth narrative. And in Matthew's gospel, she's present, but she is the silent, submissive property of Joseph. Doesn't have any lines. He gets to have all the dreams, right, and make all the decisions. But for Luke, Mary is a prophet. Make no mistake. And like Micah on this fourth Sunday of Advent, she offers us words of defiant hope. For Mary's song provides a window into a God very different than that of Jewish expectations, which vainly sought the violent overthrow of empire. And also a very different God from the one forged by Christian, Christian tradition, which very soon aligned itself with and then worshipped empire in the many forms it has taken since. But before Luke's Jesus can read the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue, you know that story, and declare his mission and the coming of the new kingdom fulfilled in their hearing that day, Mary previews what is at the heart of that mission. Nothing short of surrender and obedience to the true God revealed in Jesus. And a renouncement, as Jimi Hendrix once reminded us, 
of the love of power and a submission to the power of love. Her song, the Magnificat, as it is called, Latin, Magnificat, for magnifies, as in my soul and the Lord. This song, sung by Mary, as I pointed out once before, is based on Hannah's song in the book of Samuel. It's almost verbatim in certain places. And that is because for Luke, Luke is doing a lot of, you know, uh, he does this a lot. And uh, uh, talk to me at coffee hour. I'll, I'll give you more examples. But for Luke, the story of Mary and Jesus is a filling in and a fleshing out of the Hannah Samuel story. Just as a chapter earlier, or a little earlier, a few verses earlier, the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah, John the Baptist's parents, is a filling in and fleshing out of the Abraham and Sarah story. Interesting sidebar here. Mary is too young to have a baby. Elizabeth is too old. Draw your own conclusions. And a further interesting sidebar. Hannah dedicates her son, Samuel, to the temple. And in the Quran, which gives Mary her own chapter and then some, Mary's mother dedicates her to the temple under the care of Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. Again, draw your own conclusions. But while you're doing that, know that Mary's song of praise summarizes the prophetic themes of the whole Old Testament as it shows us the way to interpret scriptures from the viewpoint of the lowly and the oppressed. It lays bare the futility of our lust for power as control, wherein a divided humanity continually grasps for the means and the power to control others and control resources, which in this day include the environment. And where justice serves wealth while punishing those deemed undesirable, and where military might is central. And it also reveals inverted values of power that lead to the equity of all peoples, as the proud and mighty are brought low, and those lowly are lifted up. And since our journey of faith is also summed up here, because it is really the quest to find Mary's different God, a God whose power is to lovingly create and serve all of creation, her song reminds us how we are all blinded by our gods of a different power and tells us where we can look to see this true God whose way is the power of love. And that is precisely in the most vulnerable, in those who were deemed outsiders by the human gods that we have created or have liked on Facebook or whom we follow on Twitter. Mary is one of the lonely ones in the typical human scheme of things, is able to see more clearly than any one of us the true God's hand at work in creation. And through the lens of Jesus, that will even begin to take a sharper focus. And Mary is not just the summary of the prophetic trajectory. She is the spokesperson and collaborator in the incarnation of what we referred to last week when reading Zechariah, as the one new humanity which is coming into being. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> Still, I don't know how comfortable we are with this Mary. Put another way, those who like Matthew's version of the birth narrative, where Joseph does all the talking, makes all the decisions, and is in the theological driver's seat, may not like the fact that in Luke, <laughs> Joseph may still be doing the driving, but he's only Mary's chauffeur. <laughs> but the discomfort runs deeper than that. And after centuries of the church mostly buying back into the tribalistic power schemes and finding it, as it has learned, easier to cooperate with empire or be silently complicit rather than stand in opposition to its extravagances and injustices, just as Jesus sat opposite the temple. We find that her words stick uncomfortably in our throats. We would love to sing them, but we cannot. And why is that? Perfect Episcopalian, the one hand and the other. Well, on the one hand, I think, that Mary's words, these words of defiant hope, and listen to them, 
He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. These can sound like words of threat rather than hope. They can sound too much like the words of too many people whom we have been taught to distrust and to fear and in turn despise and then in turn turn a blind eye when they are dealt with by those who make the rules. And it concerns us that a thousand Marys may have sung this song on the streets of Selma or the streets of Minneapolis or that they might find a new expression in the phrase Black Lives Matter, or in all the economic movements that seek to empower the worker, to expand the middle class and raise up the poor, not just continue to favor the rich and the wealthy. Or on the other hand, it may just be that we are just too old, too rigid, and again, too frightened to change. Because to fit into the new culture of God, to help birth it, we are all going to have to change radically. This is John's repentance, and I do mean we all. A prophet's words are dangerous words, and Mary's are no exception. But radical change, God's idea of change, the coming of the one new humanity, does not have to be seen as threat because they point to a future that God has ordained. God who is love. God who is light and seeks the healing of humanity, not its destruction. The hardest thing about faith, I think, is trusting in that simple truth. A last interesting sidebar. In all three stories in Luke, the one concerning Elizabeth, the one concerning Mary, and finally, those poor kings, I mean shepherds, who were out in the wrong field at the wrong time. Those stories where God's messengers appear to announce that the new order is coming, no, in fact, has arrived. The very first words uttered in all three cases are these, do not be afraid. Because what follows is good news. And the good news is that God's culture is breaking into this world to redeem human culture, begun in Jesus, continuing now through the Holy Spirit. And the unleashing of the Holy Spirit in Luke's telling begins in the wombs of that odd couple that we see today, a woman too old to conceive and an unmarried woman too young and it will begin to redeem the womb of human culture. The oppressive and violent structures of human cultures that stratify some high, some to be high and privileged and some to be low and sacrificed will now begin a leveling, the theme we have seen both in John the Baptist quoting Isaiah and now in Mary's song. The high are brought down, the low are raised up in God's culture. The response to human need is oriented around the lowest, that which human culture has always sacrificed so that God's children may have enough. And it's not an exchange of places, it's a leveling so that everyone has what, they, what it is they need. And isn't that really what we exist for? Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that the hope, the vision for this world that God has planted within all of us, deeply within us? Isn't that what God gave us hearts for? Isn't that why we carry the spark of God within? Incarnational theory, right? Incarnational theology, right? We are all bearers of God. So there's no reason to fear anything. And what a high note to end on with this season of the prophets. And what a way to, to prepare to embrace the light whose appearance among us we will celebrate at week's end. And as always, you may draw your own conclusions. Amen.